Hello everybody, Mark Azlay and Adia Vivi here, and this is Master This, where we teach you in 15-ish minutes on how to master a new skill be to become more effective in your life and your work. So today, we're going to redo the one from last time that we did on procrastination, because if you listen to it, the audio was awful. It was yeah. like massive reverb, incredible echo, um, you know, deeply embarrassing, but we're taking it as a we learning experience. We messed it up. We're taking it as a learning experience. We're moving forward. Uh, and you get, now you get to hear it again. And you also get to hear it for the first time because the last time <laughs> you couldn't hear it at all. Yes, so, we're gonna give it a second go. Second go. Today we're gonna be talking about two things. We're gonna be talking about how to reduce distractions and how to add value um, and the overarching goal of this is to help you overcome pr procrastination to be more effective in your life and in your work. So Dr. Adi, you want to tell us about reducing distraction? Yeah. So what we're going to talk about today in terms of distraction is what might create distraction in your um, progress toward your goal and how to reduce it and sometimes even work with it to create a more productive work day or work week or whatever it is that, you, that you're planning on. Um, a lot of what I'm talking about is taken from a book about procrastination by Pierce Steele, which I recommend. He's kind of like a world um, expert on procrastination. And one of the things that he talks about is the impulsivity um, that causes us to distract ourselves. There might be all these different things in our environment that pull our attention and we're pulled away from what we really want to do, what we value, what will bring us closer to our goals, towards something that will give us an immediate satisfaction. And that could be a video game, it could be food, it could be interacting with other people. It's different for different people, of course. You have something in mind as I say that? Oh, I just go to all the distractions that I go to. Uh, for me, food yeah. was a big one last week. Food was a big one. Yep, yeah. we. A lot of people talk about it, like when they are procrastinating, they're silently cooking, cleaning, whatever. Something pulls our attention and might give us immediate satisfaction that the goal that we are working toward isn't going to give us. One way of looking at that is creating smaller goals. We talked about it in the previous um, session. So what do we do? How do we make these distractions a little less available? What we need to do is address our impulsivity. And in order to reduce impulsivity, sometimes we need a little bit of a buffer. Um, Pierce Steele talks about, like if you go to a restaurant and they give you those yummy breads before the meal, you might want the immediate satisfaction of eating those yummy breads. And by that, you are going to reduce your satisfaction from the meal that you actually ordered, the meal that you actually came to the restaurant to eat. So in order for you to be able to not fill up your tummy with the immediate distractions, you might need to push it away. So people like push the bread away, they put a napkin on it, and that split second of a different can make a real impact on how likely you are to engage. So think to yourself, what is the map of your distractions? What are the things that you do immediately and repeatedly that help you avoid the task that you actually want to do and was committed to do? If it's a video game, can you hide it in your phone? If it's your phone in general, can you put it elsewhere for half an hour, for an hour? Can you use the satisfaction of that distraction as a reward rather than as a way to avoid the task? And creating even a split second of a difference, like a, a second or two of a difference actually will reduce the likelihood that you will engage with the distraction in exponential percent. Um, so try to think to yourself, how can I put away the distractions? Just physically not have them around me. In addition, remember we talked about the stories that we tell ourselves. Those stories will increase the likelihood that we will be pulled to engage with the distractions because the distractions not only distract us from the task at hand, remember that they also distract us from the feeling and the thoughts that the task at hand bring up for us. And that might be, I might fail, or this is really important, or I'm not in the perfect condition. To, there could be all these different stories. And when we play a video game or eat or talk to a friend, we don't think about these things. And that's nice. That gives us an immediate reward. So as always, being mindful is the first step to making any change. Start noticing what are the thoughts that pull you to want to avoid. 
What are these thoughts? And have a bank of statements that you pre-made maybe that will help you engage with the task rather than distract. That could be, I, you know, yes, I'm stressed about this and I might fail and I still want to engage in it. Whatever it is, you can be creative with that. Um, yes, this is really scary and everything in my body tells me to play a video game and I made a commitment to this. So acknowledging the, the part that wants to distract, giving it a little pet on the head, like, yeah, I know you're here. Not shaming it, not attacking it, not saying negative things about it, not calling yourself names like lazy, because that will just reduce your capacity to engage and increase your desire to distract. Giving it a little pet of the head, I know you're here, thank you, I know I wanna eat right now, and I made a commitment, so I'm going to work for 15 minutes before I do that. Any thoughts about that, Mark? Yeah, what I wanted to add is, what we know from neuroscience studies and fatigue and willpower is that what actually drains energy isn't so much doing tasks as switching tasks. So every mm -hmm. time you move towards a distraction, you're actually draining your brain glycogen faster than doing the actual work. Uh, this idea of you know hard shifting or multitasking is, is a myth. You know, especially with a lot of us in the you know millennial or Gen X generation, we're like, oh, we're incredible right. multitaskers, uh, but that actually oftentimes leads us to procrastination, to burnout, to stress, because our brain is constantly having to reconfigure when it wants to do a different task. So a quick tip for that is to take tasks that you know that lead to distraction. The easiest example that I've found, and this is a, this is a practice that I do in my life um, about internet searching, is I have you know notepads, and when I wanna search for something on the internet, I will actually write it down on that notepad until I have about you know three to five things, and then search for them all in a sequence in a chunk. Because I know for me that the moment I open up an internet browser, it is game on. I'm going to be on social media. I'm going to be checking my email. I can very easily spiral off into new things. But if I can chunk together the work tasks of searching for things, you're trying to look up information, um, it actually reduces my ability to distract. And more importantly, it reduces the amount of times that I have to shift between different modes of being in my brain. I love that because indeed it is such an energy suck sucking thing to move from one thing to another and the needing to push away the distraction and re-engage in a task that's already maybe difficult for you or raises some anxiety is exhausting so if you can make sure that the distractions are not there and that you respect them and their pool and i see this as a combination try to put them away hide them in a closet put them in another room give them to someone else create a bit of a sanitary work environment and do what Mark just suggested. Make sure that you respect the part of you that wants the distraction. Write it down, allocate a particular amount of time after a chunk of the work that you decided to do is done to engage in that and know when that's going to happen. So the call for distraction will have an answer. It wouldn't be something that you completely ignore. And then you both are not going to lose energy because you keep changing tasks and you're not going to lose energy because you have to fight something all the time. That's very difficult. I want to end this part and move to the other part by asking people to tell us about their map of distraction. Like what is distracting to you? What are the things that are maybe in your environment that you're like, aha, uh -huh, that is something I write because of this video I thought of that maybe I can put in another room. Um, and what are some ways that you can put it away, either metaphorically or physically in your phone, in your browser? What are some techniques that you can use to put the distractions in a box for a while? Yeah, I want to end by doing a quick little um, metaphor that helped me in my own treatment, this idea of cultivating a houseplant. You know, so when you have a plant, you can't really tell it, oh, I want you to grow taller here. I want you to put a flower here. I want you to put some leaves here. I'll get rid of these leaves, right? What you can do though, is do a lot to better its environment and make sure that it gets enough sun, that it's in a happy place, that you pick the bugs off it, remove the dead limbs. And over time that plant will, will um, flourish and thrive. And we're very much the same way. You know, it, I think it takes a level of humility to be like, look, I'm pretty much uncontrollable in a lot of my life. But what I can do is I control my environment by hiding distractions, by setting up workflows, by making a home office that makes sense uh, for me and for my brain in order to fully be able to be present in my life and in my work. So on that note, let's talk about adding value. What are some ways that we can yeah. add value to some of these tasks that we're doing? Even if we, you know, we hate them, how can we make them better? So 
adding value to a task is making a less desirable task into a more desirable one by creating some add-on that you, that you kind of um, enrich that task with. So a very common example is if you want to exercise, you want to have um, a better sense of your body, you want to feel stronger, you want to feel like your body is healthier, and you don't, adding a friend to that equation might result in more commitment and less procrastination of that. I know that for myself, every Friday morning, me and my friend are going for a walk in uh, Prospect Park. And I love going for that walk. And on Friday mornings, um, I actually have the time because my first appointment is actually with your mark at 1030. I don't have any clinical work in the morning. Um, but I still wouldn't go to the park if my friend and I didn't have that standing appointment. So her company and the fact that on the way back, we're gonna get iced coffee, support local businesses in Corona, all of that creates an added value to the just walk in the park, which in and of itself is very valuable to me. And I procrastinate on it. I will probably not do it unless I have that added value. Um, so adding a person that makes the task more fun, makes it more interactive is often something that people do. Another thing is to do it in a different location that's more pleasant. You're more likely to maybe read a book that's a little heavy and you really wanted to read it when you're at the beach and everything is nice and relaxing. How can I combine location, personal interactions, um, timing in order to increase the value of this task for me? I don't know if you have any other ideas about adding value that might come to mind. Yeah, I wanted to look at it from the other angle, which is adding internal value, you know, mm -hmm. which I think is oftentimes for people part of a larger issue that we will cover in 10,000 ways on this series. It comes back to life mission, life purpose, goals, life vision, which so if you don't feel like you have this, it's OK. You I would say you'd be surprised or maybe you wouldn't be surprised about how many people really feel lost out there in the world. But if you're not one of those people. Being able to understand how a certain task can create a transferable skill or can help you get better at something or move towards our larger goal can help add value. So, you know, in our last episode, I used this episode, this thing as an example of seeing, you know, in doing this, me and Adi were practicing public speaking, which will benefit us across our careers. You know, we're learning audio by failing, right, by messing up and by fixing it. You know, we're mm -hmm. learning um, how to use the technology. We're learning how to use Facebook and Facebook Live. Um, we're practicing keeping commitments to each other. We're deepening our relationship by having a thing to bond over. So there's a lot of value that can be added internally by fitting in whatever you're doing into a larger narrative. Because at the end of the day, a lot of tasks and a lot of tasks that are actually very valuable are hard, right? They're difficult yep. and we encounter a lot of you know emotional resistance you know, feeling incompetent, feeling insecure, um, not having the answer right away, you know, really having to stretch ourselves and to think and act in a new way that, you know, ultimately makes us smarter, more effective, higher functioning people, but in the moment feels really bad. So by having right. that frame, it can really help us to be like, oh, this is what learning is. This is part of the learning process to get better, to struggle, to overcome. And over time, you know, you get a couple of wrinkles in your brain, right? You get, you get a little smarter. I totally agree. And I have a good example for that. So I, I work in a clinic and I have a lot of paperwork to do. Typically people who are not working in private practice or working for a hospital have lots of paperwork to do. And you can bet that it's the least favorite part of my day. Like I don't want to document, especially I don't want to document like those little interactions that you have that are like, you're kind of like, do I really have to write this down? So what I've started doing is combining these two advice. When I go to write my notes, I make myself a nice cup of tea and I bring some cookies and I know that I get cookies. I literally get cookies when I do the paperwork. And I also tell myself that the more I do this effectively, the earlier I can go home and not think about work. For me, I've trained myself that if I don't do my paperwork that day, that it's heavy on my heart and I think about it. And so the added value for me is one, I get literal cookies, and two, I get to have the rest of the evening, the rest of the day free of those thoughts, free of having to worry about that. Um, I also tell myself, tomorrow's Adi is going to thank you because my days at the clinic are very full. So if I leave the paperwork, even if I just really don't have a choice and that's just how the day panned out, 
Like I'm thinking of tomorrow as a day. And that day when I, if today's Tuesday, tomorrow when I walk into work or into my office, home office at these days, I will remind myself that I don't have any. And I was like, thank you yesterday, Ali. Kind of adding that value of taking care of yourself. And that's, I think, what you were saying, Mark. Taking care of your knowledge, your learning, your sense of accomplishment, taking care of expanding your capacities, taking care of tomorrow you that doesn't have to deal with this anymore. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a whole other topic, and I love that topic. I, I do the same trick of building a relationship with past and future Mark. You know, trying to really invest in that guy and make sure that he's set up for success. I think there's a lot to say there, and I found it to be an incredible tool in just relating with myself as I would with a friend or with a family member or with someone that I'm really on their team and I want to succeed. Mm -hmm. So we have to start to wrap up here. Um, please yep. let us know in the comments how you've added value um, or even tasks. You know, what, what, what would be fun is if you have a task that doesn't have a lot of value that you hate doing, post it. And Adi and I can comment of ways you might be able to add value to it or ways you might be able to mm -hmm. overcome some of the resistance you have to executing on the goals and plans and dreams that you have. Yep, we really, really want to love, and we would love to hear, we want to hear about how do you procrastinate? What's your distractions? How do you add value? Um, how do you engineer deadline for yourself? All the things that we had talked about in the last couple of weeks, do tell us, it will focus us in, let us know what people really need and what will be useful. And also just let, let us kind of enjoy the ongoing conversation with the audience. Totally. So we will be back uh, next Friday, not this Friday, but the following Friday, uh, bringing in some psychoanalysis and bringing in some psychology. So we're going to go a little bit level deeper on the procrastination. So hope you stay tuned and you listen to that and we'll see you all then. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye.